also email Olga. So now onto the program we've been waiting for. Today's alumni college session, The Solar Panel, Bright Ideas for Powering Our Energy Future, will run about 90 minutes. Our speakers will present for about 15 minutes each, and then we'll have 30 to 45 minutes for Q&A. It's my honor to introduce our solar panelists, Zachary Holman, class of 2005, Peter Lilienthal, class of 1978, and Chris Greeson, class of 1991. Zach is an associate professor in the School of Electrical, Computer, and Energy Engineering at Arizona State University and the Director of Faculty Entrepreneurship. He received his PhD in Mechanical Engineering from the University of Minnesota for his work on plasma synthesized silicon and germanium nanocrystals, after which he spent two years as a postdoc uh, researcher developing high efficiency silicon solar cells at École Polytechnique Fédérale de Lausanne in Switzerland. Uh, his research group at ASU focuses on new materials, processes, and device designs for high efficiency silicon solar cells and silicon based tandem solar cells. He is the co-founder of two startup companies based on ASU research, Swiftcoat and Sunflex Solar. Peter is global microgrid leader for UL and was the founder and CEO of Homer Energy. Since 1992, he has been the developer of the National Renewable Energy Laboratory's Homer Hybrid Power Optimization Software, which has been used by over 250,000 energy practitioners in 193 countries. Peter was the senior economist with the international programs um, with international programs at NREL from 1990 to 2007. He was one of the creators of NREL's Vi Village Power Program, and he has a PhD in management science and engineering from Stanford University. His ex expertise is in the economic and financial analysis of renewable and microgrid projects. Chris has worked as a renewable energy mini grid consultant to the World Bank since 2007. He works on policy and hands-on implementation of renewable energy projects from the village to the national level. He helped Thailand to develop the region's first regulations supporting grid-connected renewable energy, now counting for about 4,000 megawatts of small grid-connected renewables. He co-founded the Border Green Energy Team, where he helped rural communities build micro-hydropower projects and trained backpack medics to build ruggedized solar electric systems in medical clinics for populations suffering from a decades-long civil war in Myanmar. He has worked on renewable energy mini-grid projects in Cambodia, India, North Korea, Laos, Myanmar, Micronesia, Nigeria, Tanzania, Ethiopia, Rwanda, Thailand, Vanuatu, and Native American reservations in the United States. Chris holds a PhD in energy and resources from the University of California at Berkeley. Currently, he's working with the World Bank and UN to deploy solar hybrid power systems for COVID-19 hospitals in Haiti. So that was a lot, They're a very accomplished bunch and I'm really excited to turn it over uh, to Zach. Thank you very much and welcome everyone this morning. I'm excited to kick things off and to talk about solar. I'm gonna jump right in. I wanna provide some context so that we're all speaking the same language when, when Peter and Chris um, take over. And so I'm going to start by uh, a sort of background and introduction to solar power. Um, in particular, there are actually two different types of uh, solar power. There's what we call a concentrating solar thermal um, power, which are big plants in the middle of the desert in places like Arizona where I now live. And um, these systems use mirrors to reflect sunlight to a central point where it's absorbed and it creates a bunch of heat. And that heat is then used to turn a turbine as in any other conventional power plant. And to give you some scale, these mirrors that you can see here are 18 feet across. So these are not things you'll ever find on someone's house. On the other hand, photovoltaics um, are panels that convert sunlight directly into heat, excuse me, into electricity, with no heat along the way. As a matter of fact, solar panels, photovoltaic panels don't like to be hot. They prefer to be cold, but receiving lots of sunlight. And you'll find these both at utility scale, uh, like that photo drawn here, and also uh, on rooftops, which you may be more familiar with. The sort of uh, basic unit of a photovoltaic system, whether it's on a rooftop or in the middle of a desert, is a PV panel. And the basic unit inside of that is a photovoltaic cell, which you see right here from my laboratory. So I think for all of today, we're gonna to be talking about photovoltaics and I'll use the word solar to refer to the photovoltaics and I'm not talking about concentrating solar thermal power. 
Um, and part of the reason for that is because there's way more PV or photovoltaics than there is concentrated solar power. So this is a snapshot of solar installations in the US as a function of year. And there's a number of things I wanna point out here. First of all, these bars show you the amount of solar power that was added in the US um, in a given year. And so we can see, for example, that since 2010, uh, there's been a large increase in the amount installed um, each year. That's one important point. Solar power is growing rapidly in the US, although it looks like, at least according to predictions, it may saturate some in the future. A second important point is if you look at this, this uh, curve in the background, which refers to the right axis, that's the total amount. That's if you add up all of these bars. And so we're somewhere right around here at the moment, which is 100 gigawatts. And to put that into perspective, um, if you remember back to the future, I believe that is approximately uh, 100 uh, time traveling cars that Doc built. <laughs> but those, those consume a lot of power apparently because uh, this is also 10 billion LED light bulbs uh, that you could power or um, something like 1 million Nissan Leaf vehicles accelerating at full speed. That's how much solar power we have um, in the US at the moment. The final point I want to make on this slide is um, while we often think of, of solar power as being something on people's rooftops, that part is actually the green bit down here. Most of the solar power installed in the US is in large uh, power plants, so-called utility scale PV. So just something to keep in mind, most of what we'll be talking about today applies to both types of systems. Um, speaking of power plants, uh, this is uh, just a snapshot here of the US where each of, each of these symbols shows you a solar power plant. Um, and you can see that there's a lot of them in the Southwest and in the South, but um, even in places like Minnesota and Oregon, there's now appreciable numbers of solar power plants. So I said there's 100 gigawatts of solar power in the US, but without giving you the context of how much power generation there is in total in the US, you don't know if that's a large or small fraction of our, of our uh, electricity generation capacity. So this chart breaks it out with probably more information than we need on a state-by-state -state basis. Let's look at Arizona, um, where I live. This says that um, almost 7% of um, Arizona's total electricity generation now comes from solar, and almost 10% of the electricity it consumes comes from solar. And the reason those numbers don't match up is because Arizona is a net electricity exporter uh, primarily to California. So that gives you some context. And you can also look down here to see that Arizona is um, doing better than the, the, uh, the national average, in part because we have great sunlight, not because we have great politics per se. And um, we're at more like 3% of, um, of uh, total electricity generation and consumption in the US is coming from solar. So big picture message, solar is ramping up very quickly. Uh, there's more and more of it all the time, and yet we're still a small fraction of total electricity generation capacity. So why is it that um, the amount of solar has been increasing rapidly? Well, it's because the price of solar power has dropped appreciably in the last decade. Here I'm showing you uh, the, the price per watt of electricity generated over the last 20 years on home rooftops. This is residential systems, and you can see maybe a factor of three or so drop in price. What's interesting is uh, for you know, a small photovoltaic system that's not on your rooftop, but on your grocery store's rooftop, um, it's cheaper. And furthermore, if it's on top of a, a, a large like football stadium or something like that, it's cheaper still. And not shown here, if you install a utility scale power plant, which might instead of excuse me, having 20 solar, power, solar panels, it might have 2 million solar panels. It's cheaper still, quite a bit, more like $1 per watt. So what's going on here? Why is the cost of solar so dependent on the type of installation? Um, the answer is not because the panel price differs, but because everything else differs. So now we've got, you know, for residential systems, uh, the cost of one system broken down according to some of its components. The inverter, that takes the DC power that a solar panel generates and converts it to AC, which all of your devices and the grid runs on, has been and continues to be quite cheap. 
the solar panel itself uh, has dropped crazy cheap, more than an order of magnitude or a factor of 10 in the last 10 years, and is now a really small fraction of the total system cost. What's kind of amazing is that everything else, the so-called balance of systems costs, dominates the cost of um, a, a, a solar or photovoltaic system today. And that's true not only um, on your, your rooftop, but also on uh, larger rooftops. And in fact, it is this portion here that changes um, as you go to larger system size. You can imagine that if an engineer has to design only 20 panels and work around uh, your chimney and the angle of your particular rooftop, there's way more engineering per panel installed than if you have uh, hundreds of acres of desert and you step and repeat, install 2 million panels. So the driving cost here is no longer the modules. The modules are cheap, it's everything else. So this, uh, this chart makes that same point a different way, it gives us a little bit more uh, detail. Here we're looking at a, at a typical rooftop residential system. This is the module and um, it was only like 20%, that was in 2018. The module cost is now less than half of that in 2021. And so the module is like only 10% of a system that you would put on your rooftop. And even if you build one of the large utility scale systems, it's about one third now of the total system cost. So how did it come to be that the module is so cheap compared to everything else? And how can we, can we change that moving forward? That's, that's what I'm gonna talk about now. So first, how did the module come to be cheaper than, than everything else? It turns out we improved making modules or panels a lot faster than we improved installing them. So this shows um, the total amount of uh, photovoltaic power installed in the US. By the way, this right here is 1 billion square meters or 10 billion square feet for scale. And this is the, this is the cost. And um, this, uh, this downward trend actually goes back all the way to 1980 with a so-called learning rate of 28%. What does that mean? It means every time we double the total amount of solar ever installed, uh, it gets 28% cheaper. Now, on the same y-axis, I now have those balance of systems costs, everything else. And I guess I didn't elaborate on it, but everything else here, um, I mean um, the racking and wiring, so to hold the panels to your rooftop, for example, and paying the people to put them up there, and developing the site, and permitting, and then engineering uh, to design the system for your, your, panel, your, your rooftop in the first place, et cetera. So all of those things, Notice how much flatter these slopes are, even though they're on the same scale. That means we've gotten, um, uh, we're, we're much slower to make the installation cheaper. In fact, the learning rate is only 10%. And so uh, these guys have come down by about a factor of two in 10 years, whereas this has come down by a factor of 10 in 10 years. This is going to continue. Um, and so it begs the question, how do we go about making solar uh, electricity cheaper given that all the technology part that we work on, the panels are already cheap. Well, the answer is that we make them as efficient as possible. And by efficiency, we mean the conversion of um, sunlight into electricity. We want that process to be as efficient as possible. Why is that? Well, because we're gonna pay the same engineering and the same installation cost, uh, whether we put up um, inefficient panels that produce only a little power, or efficient panels that produce twice as much power, uh, but the cost per power will be way better in the latter case. So we're driven uh, to a scenario where we're trying to make panels and the whole system as efficient as possible. And in fact, you can see this um, in the trends of panel efficiency um, over the, the last 15 years or so. Um, there's, there's a few different types of, of solar panels here too, actually. Uh, but you can see that all of them are getting more efficient in time. And recently this trend has accelerated. Today, if you go buy solar panels, they're about 20% efficiency and there are some out there that are more than 22% efficiency. Two things I wanna talk about. First of all, you might've noticed that this plot is only for silicon PV modules, which is one flavor of photovoltaic panel, but there are others out there. And the other thing I'm gonna address in just a minute is, come on, Zach, 20% is not very good, right? Uh, <laughs> There's hundred percent out there. What's happening to the other 80% of the power? So first about the, the silicon. 
The reason I'm talking about silicon is that it um, dominates the market. This, uh, the, the, the width of this, this plot um, is proportional to the total amount of uh, solar modules manufactured in a given year. And you can see all along the blue parts um, together are silicon and they're like 95% of the market. So really solar, silicon, basically synonymous. At this point in time, all that, that might change. And the silicon stuff um, starts as sand. It's refined into chunks of the uh, silvery material, polysilicon, that is then melted and cooled in a uh, particular fashion and then cut up into what we call wafers, thin, thin uh, um, uh, wafers of material. We then add layers to the front and rear side, add materials to the front and rear side of the silicon wafer in order to turn it into a solar cell. And these get wired together uh, to make a module. Most of the innovation historically and, and still is on the, the, the solar cell itself. And so I've given you a cross section here just so you can kind of feel what, it, what an engineered um, solar cell looks like. You can see the, the silicon wafer uh, in, the, in the middle. And you can see that there's, there's materials indicated in different colors that have been added on the front and rear side that take this vanilla wafer and turn it into a functioning solar cell that direct electrons in one direction and not the other, for example. And over the last few years, most of the innovation has been in making uh, the layers that are added to the front and rear more sophisticated uh, or out of better materials. And that is what, what has driven up the uh, efficiency of the, the solar cells. However, we're only at 20% for modules. And I tell you what, with this one material, we'll never beat 30%. That's what the physics tells us. Um, this plot is a theoretical calculation that shows that if you have one material, like just silicon, you can't get much better than 30%. And it turns out um, that's because uh, the semiconductor materials used in solar cells prefer to convert one wavelength or color of light into electricity. And they do not such a great job at all the others. And yet the sun, gives us this whole um, spectrum. So if we lived in a monochromatic world, then we could do a lot better at solar power, but uh, I think there would be some other compromises. Note, however, that if we somehow add other materials to silicon, a second one, let's say, all of a sudden the efficiency potential goes up quite a bit. And so putting two different types of materials together, one which picks off the visible portion of the spectrum and converts it to electricity, and another that takes the uh, infrared um, is the best way to increase the efficiency to further decrease the cost by reducing the balance of systems costs. We would call such a cell or module a uh, tandem photovoltaic cell. This is where uh, a lot of my own um, research has been over the last few years. And there is an emerging kind of leading, uh, leading horse in the race for what type of material to use with um, silicon. And that is perovskite, which is actually a family of materials, it's a, it's a crystal structure. And we and others have demonstrated, uh, these numbers are a bit old, now 28 and 29% efficiency instead of the 20 that you saw before. And there's a path to more than 30, uh, which in turn will further reduce cost. So with that, um, I hope I've given you some background rather quickly. Uh, we'll have time to discuss afterwards. I would like to point out, however, that we can make the best solar panels in the world and that does not solve our energy challenges. Um, the solar panels are only gonna generate electricity uh, when the sun's shining. That isn't gonna change. So we need electricity storage in one form or another. And we need a, a resilient grid um, that is both capable of, of, of taking electricity generated by these solar panels or by, by battery storage, for example, and storing it and then redistributing. Um, so with that, I'm going to uh, turn it over to Peter, um, who's going to pick up from there and tell you more about grids. Well, thank you, um, Zach. And let me make sure I get the right. Um, nope, that's uh, deck here. And I don't think I have the right one. Yes, I do. Um, so hopefully you're seeing my screen here with, uh, it says Homer Energy by UL across the top. And I apologize, I'm recycling slides. I'd give about three or four of these presentations every month, um, but I will, I've customized it a little bit. Um, and as um, Zach said, um, it's not just about the photovoltaic panel. There's a whole system here. Um, 
And um, I'm going to be explaining. We, we've focused on microgrids for reasons that I'll explain in in, the, in, in a minute. Um, but let me just give a little history because I've been doing this specifically about how to design um, power systems using solar and wind as well. But now it's almost all solar um, since 1992. Uh, it was a it was a spinoff from not a spinoff but a kickoff by the um, Earth Summit in Rio in 92, where the US promised the developing world with it would help them use renewable energy. Didn't have a clue how to do that, but we were a research lab, the National Research Renewable Energy Laboratory, and that was, it fell to us. We created the Village Power Program. Chris has been, has, was part of that actually, um, the next speaker. Um, and so I created this piece of software, it was an internal research tool, used GAM software, which I think I learned at Reed. Can't remember where I learned about GAMS um, and uh, Unix workstation, and, and it was just a, a research project. But we converted it to a Windows app, put it up on the web, and about in the late '90s, people started downloading it. Um, then the politics changed in the 2000s, and so the Village Power program went away. Uh, so by 2008, well, it's a long story. Anyway, I ended up spinning off or spinning off from NREL, creating Home Energy a private company. Um, Grew it for 10 years. Uh, we were acquired in 2019 by UL. Uh, and I'll, initially, we just focus on microgrids for developing countries. And, and well, I'll, I'll show that in a minute. But it, and as the um, Amy said, it's been used by over 250,000 people. The dots on those maps are places where people have designed microgrids with our software. So that's over 90,000 projects. Some of them are just sort of academic. So it's not, not, I don't want to say there's 90,000 microgrids out there, um, but um, it, you can see where the activity is, and we have a lot of data about it. Um, so normally I go into this slide in a lot of detail because I'm sort of pitching my software, but um, I'm not going to do that here. Suffice it to say there's a lot of analysis required. You have to simulate how the systems are going to operate hour by hour or minute by minute. Then you have to do that for hundreds of systems to find the least cost system. Uh, and there's a lot of uncertainty, especially for smaller projects, because uh, you can't afford to do the kind of data acquisition that you, for a small project that you do for a large project. So sensitivity analysis is really important. Um, so I'm not going to go into that in a lot of detail because because this is not a sales call. <laughs> um, instead, I've added some slides just talking about the, how this industry has evolved because I've been doing it for, for a very long time. Um, and there's a lot of new people in the industry now. And so I can provide a, a unique perspective having, really, I got this started by reading Small is Beautiful at, while I was trying to write my thesis at, uh, at Reed. Um, and in honor of Reed, when I decided I had this software to, to sell to people, and I called it the hybrid optimization model, home, 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 what do I do with that? And I made it into Homer. Just so, you know, Reed has had, has had that effect on me. Um, so um, this is a slide um, graph from an earlier version of Homer, actually. Uh, and but what I'm trying to show here is that, um, well, it's a sensitivity analysis on the capital cost of PV. And Zach did a great job of showing how that's come down. And, and um, the price of diesel, because for microgrids, you know, we were mostly initially focusing on remote areas where people are burning diesel, to, well, where the only alternative is to, well, the only alternative was to just burn diesel 24 seven. Um, and you can see, even though the um, price of diesel has fallen recently, um, the price of PV has fallen more. And as that variety, uh, relationship changes, the least cost, proportion of, of, of renewable or in this case solar on a grid has been increasing and it, people talk about um, wanting to get 100% renewable well we're not even close uh, and there's a lot of technical hurdles to get there but microgrids are, are leading the way uh, and we're and and the least cost microgrid these days is in the 80 to 90 percent uh, level actually um, so I thought it would be useful to for everybody to see how this has evolved over time. And in the 90s, like I said, we're, these were just research and pilot projects. Uh, we stuck one in Wales, Alaska, which is actually the westernmost tip. It's where man first set foot on northern hemisphere in the Western Hemisphere, supposedly. 
So it's very, very remote. Um, and <laughs> we didn't have any remote monitoring. So that was a big lesson learned. The thing was down for six months. The local people knew it, but they didn't have any way to fix it. We could have fixed it, but we didn't know it was down. So these days, remote monitoring is super cheap and it'd be, it'd be tragic. It'd be a sin to not have remote monitoring on any system you put in there. There were issues with power electronics back then the inverter in, in San Juanico, Mexico, that's a little fishing village in Baja. Um, that was another lesson learned, big lesson learned on one of the very first project in Mexico. And, and it took a while for a lot of these grant um, development agencies to really figure this out. But if you just parachute technology into a remote area, you don't involve the local people, you don't have it figured out how you're going to support it. These systems don't need a lot of maintenance compared to a diesel generator, but that's very different from saying they need zero maintenance. And um, so that system just collapsed because nobody was taking care of it. And one of the biggest problems was storage batteries. Back then, lead acid batteries like you have in your car were the only option. And they really aren't very good. They're kind of okay for starting your car, I guess. But for these applications, they're just not durable enough. Um, so in St. Paul, Alaska, that was a successful project it's a picture of it there. It's probably on a typical July day, it's probably the coldest place in America because it's in the middle of the Bering Sea. They need heat all the time. So they developed a system that didn't use any batteries at all, managed it, its grid stability, which is a difficult technical issue, simply with load control. So they would run 100% renewable without any batteries, just by having high speed switching of heating for some community loads. It, it's an, technically impressive thing. And it was almost 25 years ago they did that. And it was all with private money with the Alaska Native Corporation's private money. So that, I love pitching that uh, system. Um, and then in the 2000s, we started looking at more systems. And one of the things that was very popular then was what were called fuel saver systems to avoid using batteries but it is very limited in how much energy a grid can absorb without any storage at all, especially a smaller, well, any size grid really. Um, but on a smaller grid, what happens, actually a similar thing happens on a large grid too, where you're pushing the, the rest of the system, the thermal generation, whether it's diesel or whatever it is, to, down to lower loads, which are less efficient. You can't turn them off because of the variability of solar and wind. Um, so you have to leave these things running. They're running at low loads. That's inefficient. It actually increases your maintenance costs. Um, they, they, do, they do save fuel and money, but it's, it's, it's very limited. And a and um, counter example is this one in Kodiak, Alaska, um, which is 99% renewable, but it also has a hydro resource. So that's really helps a lot. It also has some innovative storage technologies. A flywheel was flywheel's not that innovative, but it's, it's, it's uncommon. Uh, but they've got a two megawatt crane there that when they lifting stuff out of a boat, slapping on a huge load, and when it's lowering that cargo, it's putting two megawatts back onto what is a modest size, pretty big island, but still modest size load. So there's a lot of innovation that was uh, done and experience and expertise created on these microgrids in the past. And then the 2010s came around and you we all have a different variation on this slide showing how much the technology's improved. But I wanna talk about storage in addition to PV because it's following lithium, um, is following right in the path that um, PV pioneered of lowering prices. It's not, it's, it's got a later start and it's not quite as far along yet, but um, that is changing the world. That is, that is going to, blow away these limits on how much renewables you can put on a grid. Um, but they're very, it's very hard to model storage. It's a much more challenging uh, design question because solar and wind, they just produce power and dump it on the grid and the grid absorbs it and there's no operational decisions. But with batteries, you, you, you have to decide when to charge and when to discharge. And there's a lot of different um, value streams that the batteries can provide and they compete with each other. So um, that's our job, actually. So now the 2020s moving forward, utility scale hybrids are the future. Uh, they, as Zach did a good point of showing, um, I don't want to 
even though in terms of megawatts and gigawatts, they're bigger, the distributed um, deployments of solar and storage have a, the ability to provide resilience, which is really important. Uh, so relying on power coming from great distances away, as we saw in Texas, is, a, is, is, is not, is you're vulnerable, it's not resilient. We're seeing in California with the wildfires, we saw on the East Coast with the hurricanes. It, if you want resilience, and what we've learned is that um, it's not just the hospital that needs to have super, and the data centers that need to have super reliable power. If you're gonna have the power out for a week at a time, the grocery store, the pharmacies, the gas stations, police stations, traffic lights, there's all kinds of things that, that and, and diesel generators by themselves, in a situation like that, there aren't enough fuel trucks to keep them going. So this is the, this is the, the solution. And now that batteries have gotten, are getting really good, um, um, we have a solution. And electric vehicles could be uh, the total power of all, the US light vehicle fleet is 10 times greater than the total power of the electric sector. So there's an enormous opportunity there. So in conclusion, we believe hybrids are the future. And it's not just us, the CTO of GE Renewables says the same thing. Actually, everybody in the industry is saying this now. Uh, and they're becoming much larger. They're not just pilot projects anymore. They're not just for these uh, distributed um, remote areas, et cetera. They're, they're, the, it, Zach showed a map of all the solar installations around the country, and there were a few um, colored uh, spots where they showed solar plus storage. That's, that's just starting. And, and literally in the last year, things have changed dramatically in terms of the uptake of storage on these large uh, solar projects. So it's changing rapidly. Um, and um, microgrids led the way, which is um, um, crucial. Uh, and the other thing that Zach said that I wanna end on was that, and, and it's sort of our rationale for what we do is he talked about all of the um, soft costs. And so we're making our software available and people tell us like, we should raise our price, but we wanna make it widely available. Uh, we still charge for it, but um, to, to help lower those engineering costs and marketing, it's, and it's beyond engineering, it's the whole marketing development, um, development process as well. Uh, so that's our role in the world. Um, and um, with that, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Chris. Great, thank you, guys. Um, let's see, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. Hopefully. So. Um, as Zach mentioned, uh, the vast majority of solar panels that are going in these days are going into grid connected and especially utility scale systems, uh, solar farms. My work focuses on kind of a tiny sliver of the way that solar panels are being used, but, um, but a pretty useful sliver. Uh, and that connects a lot too with what uh, Peter had show, uh, shared. Uh, because Peter's software is used to model a lot of these systems, but that's um, mini grids, which are providing electricity for uh, the parts of the world these days that have not had access to electricity and have traditionally been burning kerosene for lights at night and, and not having a lot of other options. Um, and This is a, a mini, this particular picture is a mini grid of uh, powering a village in Ethiopia called uh, Kor Isle. And while I'm talking about it, um, Olga's gonna pull up a, a video that has kind of a cool drone footage just around this video grid and, and I'll keep on talking a bit. Um, it's part of a, a, a generation of these solar mini grids that are proving to be the most cost effective way to electrify rural communities in parts of the world that are lacking access to electricity. And it uses uh, solar panels with cells that are in their physics, basically what, what Zach is working to optimize in the laboratory and, and likely is, was designed with the software that uh, Peter Lilienthal's company developed. And 
here you can see obviously that most of the area is taken up with the, the solar panels themselves. Um, there's this uh, white uh, shipping container looking box in the back. Let's see, I think I might need to share my screen again. Yeah, um, I was going to say, go ahead and share your screen again. <laughs> and then in the back of that, you can just make out um, a transformer and, and poles that are bringing the electricity out to um, the, the customers in the, in the village, um, typically hundreds of households and, and some small businesses. Uh, for the past 15 years or so, I've been working with the World Bank and other development partners to try to scale up deployment of these types of systems. And we work uh, with countries to design and implement programs that include subsidies. Uh, we work yes, with- we still, don't, we still don't see your screen if you'd be willing to share it again. Oh, goodness. I think I just need to hit the little blue share button. Thanks. Um, yes, uh, you're good. Okay, great. So uh, we work with governments to help create programs that include uh, often a subsidy component, uh, work with regulatory authorities to put in place uh, regulatory frameworks that, that allow these systems and provide some clarity on tariffs and technical standards and what happens when the grid arrives and so forth. And, 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 and try to build in incentive structures that really uh, help ensure their sustainable operation. Um, the real hot countries these days in the past couple of years have been uh, Nigeria, Myanmar, um, parts of India, Ethiopia, and then Bangladesh. But there's dozens of, of countries, most of them in, in sub-Saharan Africa that are, that are de deploying these systems at scale. And so um, where are we today? Um, it's estimated that, well, right now there's about a bit over 800 billion people uh, sorry, 800 million people in, in on the planet that don't really have elect access to electricity. And it, that's estimated to grow to about um, that 1.2 billion will need to get access to electricity by the, the year 2030. And we estimate that about 490 million of these are going to be best served by about 210,000 mini grids that will be most mostly solar mini grids. At this point, there's about 19,000 uh, village mini grids worldwide that we've we've got some um, some information about. Most of these are are diesel powered, and serve about 47 million people. And so, a lot of our work is on uh, helping transition to this next generation of mini grids that will be solar powered. Um, there's about 7,000 mini grids that are. Um, solar that are that are planned for development in, in about 60 countries. And um, in especially the countries that don't have a lot of electricity access, we're going to need to be scaling from kind of current implementation, which is like tens of these solar mini grids up to hundreds and then and then up to um, thousands um, per year by by the year 2025 in order to, to meet this um, UN development goal of, of universal electrification by, by 2030. And maybe I'll just mention a tiny bit that, so one of the sustainable development goals is universal access to affordable, reliable, and modern energy for all. But it, it turns out that it's a goal that uh, is really linked to a lot of other sustainable development goals, like uh, reducing hunger and ensuring good health, um, quality education, clean water and sanitation, um, opportunities for decent work and economic growth, reducing inequality um, and, and gender equality. Uh, in a real big picture, achieving this scale will require work on, a, on, a, on 10 different building blocks. Um, and these are lowering the cost of the components um, including the solar panels as, as well as batteries and the power conversion electronics. And Zach touched on that a bit. Um, another thing is using geospatial tools to lower the cost of planning clusters of these portfolios of mini grids. Uh, fostering income generating uses of electricity, especially during the daytime when solar panels are making the electricity. Lowering the cost of, of community engagement, which, um, as Peter mentioned, is really an important <laughs> part element of, of these of these mini grids. Uh, 
optimizing the blend of in a country of the local know-how like it, it's when you when you work in nigeria it's you know there, there's it, it's really uh, there's there's ways to get things done in Nigeria and and international folks that come in there to help work on these projects don't know a lot that but on the other hand there's international industry that can bring um, advanced technology and 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 interesting business models and so forth so finding that that blend uh, increasing the availability and lowering the cost of finance which has a lot to do with persuading banks and other lenders that these projects are not weird and they're not too risky. Uh, scaling up training and skills building so that the countries have a pool of qualified engineers and installers and technicians um, and, and operators uh, at, at, at the village level. Developing an institutional framework and workable regulations that address the subsidies and tariffs and safety issues and environmental compliance. And then finally, setting up a, enabling a business environment that will lower risks for the private sector and, and communities to get involved in this. And so um, in the Q&A section, um, we can explore some of these in, in greater detail, but I'm gonna zoom in on, on two that are closest to solar panels themselves. The issue of the component costs and, um, and then also uh, income generating uses. So looking at the component uh, costs and, and technology, one of the things I've been doing in the past um, couple of months is collecting and trying to make sense of some raw data on mini grid component costs from mini grid developers in the field for over 400 mini grids that are um, built or, or, or very near commissioning in, in 19 different countries. And most of these are in Sub-Saharan Africa um, and a lot of the mini grids are also in Myanmar. Um, and here's how the decline in solar prices are showing up in mini grids in these countries in the in the past few years. Uh, so this is the price of the solar panels and their associated uh, PV inverters that convert uh, from DC to to AC electricity. The area of the dot is uh, proportional to the capacity of the solar array in, in each grid. And so overall, we're seeing a, a decline. Um, but as you can also see, a lot of variation among countries and, and projects. And not surprisingly, uh, we're finding that when you cluster uh, projects together in, in countries, um, the, the costs are, are quite a bit lower. Peter also mentioned the um, uh, essential change that's happening in battery technology. And this illustrates that as well. Um, the red dots are lead acid batteries, which were really dominant in these mini grids um, that were built before about 2016, 2017. And then, and then we really start to see the shift towards lithium ion batteries. Um, and, and then the, the cost trends um, due to this, this learning, uh, the rights law, every doubling uh, leads to a, a significant decrease in, in price um, is, is leading to lower and lower costs. So, so right now we're seeing about two thirds of all the new mini grids that are coming on, online are, have now switched over to lithium ion batteries. It used to be, as um, Zach mentioned, that solar panels were a, 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 the lion's share of the cost of, of solar installations. And that was true with these solar mini grids as well. But now on average, we're seeing them come in at about 10% of the total project cost. Other projects, other costs are bigger, including the cost of distribution, that's the poles and wires that deliver the electricity to customers, as, as well as the battery and the installation costs. And so now to drive down the cost of the solar mini grids, we need to focus on, on all areas. Um, and the, the small por portion that PV makes up now has you know the interesting consequence that if you, even if you cut the price of PV in half, you're only going to drop the mini grid costs by about five percent. I'm going to turn uh, now to the income generating uses, um, one of these ten pillars. Um, and when electricity from mini grids can be used to directly produce goods and services, this ends up being a a real win-win arrangement. On the one hand, users increase their incomes and then uh, mini grid developers can sell more electricity. 
amortizing the fixed costs of the mini grids over more sales of, of electricity. Um, and here's, here's some example of uh, water pumping, um, uh, running things like grinders and, and planers and, and other carpentry equipment, uh, welders, uh, things that provide a livelihood for folks in the village and also reduce the cost of building or, or repairing buildings. Uh, local milling of, of rice or grain um, reduces the transportation costs and also keeps the money flowing in within, within the local community. And uh, electric sewing machines provide opportunities for households or women's cooperatives to earn money through garment production. And uh, often the upfront costs of electric these types of electric powered equipment are a real barrier. So one thing that mini grid developers uh, are, are doing is uh, in including some opportunities for finance for these, uh, these types of tools into the electricity bill using an on bill financing model. So um, they, the users will pay over time on, on their electricity bill and, and taking advantage of the mini grid developers ability to access lower cost uh, finance than, than, a, than a typical village resident would get. A lot of the productive uses in, this pre in the previous shot, slide that I showed can be um, used or, or be encouraged to be used uh, during daylight hours and encouraging a shift of electrical loads to sunny hours can really help lower the cost of electricity from solar mini grids because it's reducing the electricity that has to be cycled through the batteries. And if you can plan on this type of daytime use, it, it reduces the need to invest in batteries and, and battery inverters and, and in uh, backup generation using diesel. So here's an example of a load curve of, that I was working with in a, a project in Chad last week. And this shows the, ex the blue line is the expected um, daily load curve. You can see a typical peak in the evening time in, in rural communities when people are coming in and uh, cooking rice and, and lighting up their, their homes and watching football and, and so forth. And then we have two other scenarios. One is, is which there's a, a lower daytime load and another is, is a, it's a higher daytime load. And I, I used, um, Peter's Homer modeling software to, to analyze the levelized cost of, of energy for these different cases. And here you can see comparing the, the, the sun following the case, which is use, using electricity, uh, encouraging these daytime productive use, uh, sun coincident uses with the, the half time, uh, the, the lower case leads to a, a levelized cost of energy difference of about eight cents a kilowatt hour, which is pretty pretty significant, about a 23% decrease in the cost of electricity. So, so a lot of the, uh, so it's an, yeah, important work to, to do in, in encouraging this daytime use of electricity, especially with the solar grids. Um, a lot of the issues that I've been discussing and, and many more are uh, discovered at length that with these, in these different World Bank uh, books that I've been writing over the past decade or so, and they're all available for, for free at those um, uh, URLs that are, that are listed there. So um, I guess I'll just end with a little bit of a reflection. Um, these, these, these mini grids are a tiny portion of the total num solar panels that are being installed these days. But for people that have them, um, like at this this uh, village, uh, Michinai in, in Myanmar, I think Peter, you you came out to visit this one too when we when we yeah. had a, the World Bank meeting out there. Um, they can make a real significant difference in the daily quality of life and the ability of people to um, have access to education and light their kitchens and charge cell phones, get news of the world. And a lot of these rural mini grids are being built in, in countries um, where there's either been a really weak or, or, or weak and repressive governments. And Myanmar is on my mind in particular these days um, with the, the tragic military coup that this happened. And so I find myself just thinking and hoping that um, 
you know, on the one hand, I don't see any solution to the citizens of Myanmar and getting their democracy back in any time in the near future. But I'd like to believe that putting clean power kind of in the hands of ordinary people can can at least be a useful tool in in the in the toolbox of um, of that transition. Um, overall, it seems you know solar PV has been really remarkable. When I did my uh, senior thesis at, at Reed, I, I did it on photovoltaics and didn't didn't have in, in my senior thesis the, the word climate change in the whole document because it wasn't really general. It wasn't part of the the, the common kind of parlance at that at, in in the early 1990s, at least at least in, in my observation. Um, and now it's 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 a technology that's that's both really promising for addressing uh, global greenhouse gases um, coming in. Uh, at, at a price now that, that's lower than, than the cost of operating existing coal plants in a lot of cases. Um, and it's also a, a, a technology that, that provides um, a lot of the resiliency that, that Peter was mentioning that gives us a, a, a hope of, um, of addressing some of the, uh, you know, surviving some of the, the challenges that will arrive with, with climate change. So um, at least <laughs> for this talk, you know, put me in the category of a technology optimist that this will be a useful tool for us going forward. So um, thanks so much. Thank you so much, uh, Zach, Peter, and Chris for sharing your expertise about solar technology, microgrids and modeling and um, telling these stories. Um, it's really inspiring to see what can be done, not just in developed, uh, developed uh, countries, but also in developing nations that uh, can really use that resiliency, as you mentioned. So thank you all uh, for participating. In, um, so uh, we've got all these great questions that you've submitted. And so we're going to start um, going through them. Um, and feel free to put some more questions in the bar as they come up. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and get started here. So um, Allison Grove says, uh, she's class of 1999, are there still environmental problems and potentially health problems for workers in the manufacturing process for solar panels? And how are they disposed of? I think I can take a first um, pass of that. Thanks for the question, um, Allison. So um, the manufacturing of solar panels, the, the supply chain is, is uh, relatively long. Again, it starts with sand and ends with panels or with disposed of panels. Um, there aren't a lot of hazardous materials um, in them. Their silicon, again, comes from sand. Uh, there's silver in them. There used to be some small amounts of lead in the um, solder um, soldering process in particular. And there, there can be some, there's trace amounts of other materials like phosphorus and, and boron. Uh, those aren't particularly nasty either. Uh, there's a lot of glass. There's also um, what we call encapsulants, which are polymers like ethylene vinyl acetate um, or polyolefins. And so there's, there's some of the chemical industry supply chain feeding into, into solar as well. I'm not, a, not aware of a lot of workplace accidents or exposures uh, related to the manufacture of, of solar panels. Uh, less nasty stuff than, for example, uh, batteries and, and, and lithium and, and that sort of thing. But um, you also bring up the question of, of uh, disposal or what should be recycling. And uh, at the moment, this is an area that's largely unaddressed. And the reason is that the panels have been designed to have a 25 year lifetime. In many cases, well-made panels exceed that. So we have panels that were installed in the 70s that are still operating at more than 80% of their original output, although it's a very small output compared to what, what today's panels make. So there just hasn't been a lot of disposal or recycling. At the moment, they just go to the dump and they will often get um, shredded. Uh, but there is interest starting right about now in developing recycling technologies because 10 years from now, there's gonna be a lot of panels that are, that are coming offline that need to be recycled. And the hardest thing is you're gluing together two pieces of glass and solar panels in the middle. And the glue is this encapsulant that I talked about, or it could be one piece of glass in the so-called back sheet and it's on the back, which is just a polymeric membrane. And you have to basically unglue this thing. And you try to glue it together so that it lasts for 25 years. So it's not trivial to unglue it. There are some valuable materials inside. There's silver, as I mentioned, right now solar is the largest um, consumer of silver in the world, uses about 10% of the world's silver. 
Uh, there's also uh, the, the silicon material itself, but not enough um, value for recycling to, to be financially worthwhile at the moment. So it'd have to be incentivized. Um, yeah, so those are some of the challenges. One caveat I'd like to say is that, remember I said silicon is 95% of the market. A decent size of, decent chunk of that remaining 5% is cadmium telluride uh, solar panels. There's only one remaining company uh, operating in that space, but they are a US company. It's one of the few US companies still in solar and that's First Solar. And uh, well, they have cadmium in them. <laughs> and they also have tellurium in them, which isn't necessarily nasty, but it's, um, it's not abundant. It's a byproduct of, if I remember correctly, like zinc mining. So First Solar is unique in that they've had a robust recycling program for decades now. They've had to in order to be able to sell their panels. And by the way, they don't sell panels for, for people's homes. They like exclusively do power plants in the middle of the desert, right? So that would be the one exception where there, there is um, uh, recycling in place. I hope that's um, answered your question. I mean, you know, I might jump in on the uh, re battery recycling. Um, lead acid batteries in the US are an incredible recycling success story. Something like 99% of all lead acid batteries in the US are successfully recycled. Um, developing countries, it's a little different. I've been in places where they're it's still got the sulfuric acid in it and it's being used as a doorstop. Uh, so that is a challenge that uh, the rest of the world has to pick up on. Uh, but as Zach said, there's a lot of interest in, in this. So we, we expect that to happen. Maybe I'll just add a tiny to what David, uh, what Peter was saying. Even in, in my experience in, in rural you know, villages in Myanmar or Nigeria, there's, there, is a, a there has been a lead acid battery recycling in this industry. Like, people come in with a pickup truck and, and pick up batteries. And, and in an extreme case, I was doing some work with a, 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 a ethnic minority group that was um, engaged in kind of a civil war in, in Myanmar. And, and we asked, well, what are you gonna do with the battery if it, if it dies for this clinic system that we said? And, and, and they said, oh, you know, we'll make, <laughs> we make ammo out of the, <laughs> the lead. And I was like, okay, well. <laughs> <laughs> not worrying about you've got bigger problems on your hands. Oh, thank you uh, all for answering that question. Uh, so Richard Solarius, class of 1958, says um, for Zach, is there any way to reduce design and residential installation costs, especially increasing the number of installations? And a second question, can you improve spectral response with organics? Plants have learned how to use the whole visible spectrum. Uh, great questions, Richard. I'm going to start with the second one because I think that Chris and Peter are going to have at least as much as I have to say on the, the first one. Um, so organic materials, yes, uh, very good at uh, absorbing light, or at least they can be. And organic solar cells were um, researched between about 2000 and 2012 or 14 or so quite heavily. Um, they have other challenges. So the light absorption is a good part. Some other parts are that they tend to be substantially less stable than uh, inorganic materials uh, over the course of a 25 year lifetime that, that modules are now warranted for. And they were never able to reach the, uh, the same high efficiencies. And uh, your background is in physics, I see. Uh, you might appreciate this. It turns out when you generate an electron hole pair in an organic material, uh, um, they're bound together as an exciton, and you have to actually split that exciton. So you have to put in a little more energy in order to, to get that out. That's not true in, um, in crystal structures with long range order like, like, like silicon. So that's part of the reason that they ended up being less efficient. Um, so the, the short answer to your question is the community has kind of moved on from uh, organics in part because the whole the group that was working on organics um, found a new shiny object, and it actually is the perovskite materials that I was, I was talking about before. And they do have some organics tucked inside of them. They're kind of a soup of materials. Uh, the most common one is methyl ammonium lead iodide, but there are, um, there are others that have you know, seven different elements in them. Uh, they've got the methyl ammonium molecule, the formamidinium molecule, which I had to practice to be able to say Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So they, they kind of the, the organic research lives on a little bit, but we've mostly moved on. Now um, the question about is there a way to reduce design and residential installation costs? Um, it's a really important one, and like I said, I'm going to let Chris and Peter comment, but I'll give a, a first first idea 
um, before, before they do. And that is, I think as long as you're adding panels to existing older homes um, or already built homes that have roofs at different angles and you've got your vent pipe here and you've got your chimney over there, it's always gonna be way more expensive than installing the same number of panels in a configuration, either on a very large rooftop, a parking structure, something like that, or, or in the middle of the desert. However, um, if you take the approach that California's taken and require that homes, new homes have to include solar so that home design includes solar, you know, roofing materials aren't cheap either, right? And so to the extent that there's, um, there's uh, overlap in functionality uh, between those two that's realized at the, the build stage of the home. Um, and, you know, my father's a building contractor in California, uh, and he would never like like to hear me endorse tract homes because that's not what he builds. But if you have a home design that you build many times, it would drive down the cost of residential solar. Um, and with that, I'll let Chris and Peter take over. Yeah, you know, if you look in Germany, they have really driven down the soft costs because they've simplified the permitting process. The, the, they're, the businesses doing the installations are operating at scale and, uh, and it dramatically reduces their marketing costs. Uh, so permitting and interconnection costs are an you know, a irritatingly large portion of the costs and partly it has to do with utility resistance. So pol policy, and that varies from place to place dramatically. Uh, but, but Germany uh, and other, especially Germany has brought down the cost of these soft costs dramatically through public policies. Um, and, uh, I'm, but I, I also do wanna say it's really important. There's no question utility scale is less expensive, but distributed solar not only provides the resilience, but to get to the really high penetrations of you know, the real low carbon economy um, without distributed solar, will require a massive expansion in the transmission system, which I've always been skeptical about just because talk about permitting problems, you know, getting a new transmission line is a decades long development process and it's very contentious. Uh, so there will be, we need both, but distributed power reduces congestion on the TND system, increases resilience and it's worth more. And you know how to, it's also costs more. So that's a, you know, a balance that needs to be figured, you know, place by place figured out. Maybe I'll just add a tiny bit. Um, Australia is another country that has had been really effective at inexpensively installing uh, residential scale solar. Their installed costs, I'm just looking at a, an article from last year, um, have come down to under a dollar a watt, whereas for our residential systems, they're at about $3 a watt. Um, so they're clearly doing some stuff that we're not. I, and I'm, I wouldn't be sure that uh, what Peter said is true, that, that permitting has a lot to do with it and, and interconnection. Also, um, the National Electric Code in the United States uh, it, it, you know, has specific requirements for PV. And, and some of the things that, like one of the fairly recent things that was added was that uh, in the event of a, of a of a power outage, you have to be able to disconnect um, solar panels at the module level, um, so they're not making electricity up on the roof. That's more expensive to accomplish, um, and and so I think there's some interesting questions about risk versus cost in um, in in the regulatory frameworks for the United States that govern this. Uh, Nick, Nico Terry uh, says, um, so building scale diesel runs through the supply and natural disaster areas within a few days, which is shorter than the outage lengths in several situations. I think this is for Peter. It was based on one of your slides. Um, that didn't sound like, wait, wait <laughs> let me reread this. Let me re just read this question. So yeah. building scale diesel runs through the supply and, blah, blah, blah. oh, well, it's not really a question, but it's absolutely true. It's a point I make all the time that that you can't really, diesel is great if you don't use it very much, but if you're gonna use it for a week straight, it's just a bad solution um, because most places at most, they have a tank that's good for a day. Um, and, uh, uh, and if, you know, so if you're worried about, we had an outage just a couple of days ago here, but it only lasted a couple of hours. 
and it happens three times a year, maybe, ah, diesel might work fine for that. But if you're worried about the hurricane or the, the, what happened in Texas, or what's going on in California now is insane, where whole communities are being shut off proactively, you know, preventative safety power shutoffs, where the utility just turns off the power because they're, they got sued for creating wildfires that killed people and they, they went bankrupt because of those lawsuits. So they're just turning off power to whole communities whenever it's dry and windy, which is pretty frequently in California. So, so now you're, there, there's just no way you can supply diesel to those places uh, adequately to keep them going um, for three or four days at a time or whatever. So very important point. I'll just add a tiny bit. In Haiti, where I work, there's um, pretty frequent times where you just can't get diesel, especially to rural areas. And if you're you know, wanting to run a hospital with oxygen concentrators for COVID patients um, and you can't get diesel, then people die. Well, yeah, actually, I'm just working with the U.S. Embassy in Niger, and they had... They they have to put, bring the diesel in through terror you know through rebel held territory. I, I don't even, I don't even know how they so half of it probably doesn't even get there. They said that they have the utility has I think he said 130 outage events you know where they have to where they, they have to turn off the utility power 130 a week. I mean I, I'm still trying to figure out exactly what that means. So there's diesel is is difficult to deal with. Thank you. Uh, Mark McLean, class of 1970 says, uh, lithium atoms are small and light, so they're good for mobile applications. Sodium atoms are larger and heavier, but for fixed location installations, they might be cheaper and failures would do less ecological damage. Is anyone exploring sodium hydride storage systems? Yes. Actually, I, I, I normally bring this up. Lithium is the clear winner where weight matters, laptops, cell phones, vehicles. Clear winner because it's, they're the lightest, it's the lightest metal. There's no question. But for stationary applications, which is what we're talking about, there are, sodium is a good one, but there's also zinc, vanadium. There's an enormous collection of chemistries, and I'm not a chemist, that, that are being looked at. Um, and that might actually be a better technical fit for stationary applications, because stationary applications, you don't care about weight. And some of these are flow batteries where you can just put a bigger tank and now you have more energy storage. Um, the challenge is that lithium ha is scaling up its manufacturing capability. We can't hear you, Peter. I'm not sure what happened. It seems like your own internal mic microphone. Your headset maybe through. died? It's not Zoom. It's your microphone died for your headset. Check my audio device. Oh, no, now you're we back. can hear you. Yeah, oh. You know, I have this weird headset. I don't, I, so sorry about that. I, so I don't know where you lost me, actually. Challenges. What? You were saying that, that something about the scale up of lithium and, and, and manufacturing is- um, Oh, okay. So that, you, you didn't lose that much, great. The cost of lithium is coming down because of manufacturing capability. And there's just a much more mature technology and it's being scaled up. And so these other technologies, which I think in some ways might be a better technical fit, may never catch up. I'd like to see them catch up. I haven't given up on them. But they're not they're nowhere near at the same level of maturity and manufacturing scale. Thank you. Uh, Richard Solarius, class of 1958, uh, says compare purely electric vehicles versus hybrids, which should have greater driving range, even charging time, uh, sorry, even charging takes time compared to filling the tank. But currently my Prius Prime only gets 25 miles on electricity only, but total distance of full tank and charge can be 450 to 500 plus miles. I believe this is for Peter. Yeah, well, so I actually have both. Uh, a leaf, pure electric, and a uh, hybrid, but not a plug-in hybrid. And I totally agree with you. In fact, before I left NREL, this was the one project in NREL that I, that I left behind that I was on, and th but we were looking at this back in 2005. And back then I thought plug-in hybrids were the solution to um, like the Prius Prime, um, because 
batteries were still expensive back then. And I thought, well, you don't need a big battery if, if you have a hybrid. Um, and I still sort of feel that way. Uh, and, and I think my next car will be a plug-in hybrid, um, but, um, but batteries are just getting cheaper. And, and, and I talked to someone at Tesla about it and they went, oh, no, 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 because they love the simplicity of just of not having anything to do with with gasoline and lubricant, you know, oil chain oil changes and you know internal combustion engines are pretty complicated, and the drivetrain and everything else they they just love the simplicity of electric. So we'll see, you know. Uh, Dustin Bowers, class of two thousand nine. Uh, this is for Zach. You mentioned that solar panels like it cool, which seems to be disadvantageous for being put in the sun. How much gain could be had by providing heat sinks or some other cooling mechanisms in a place like Arizona? Thanks for the, the question. I, I went and, and grabbed a slide from one of my PhD students to try to inform my, my answer on this, this topic here. So um, first question is, why is it that solar panels are getting hot? And um, we can look on the, the right side over here. So here's the full spectrum of, of incoming light. And about 20% of it, as you can see on the right, is converted to electrical power. Some of the um, other ones, this yellow one and, and these two blue ones, we can't really, um, well, the way to, to lose less of that uh, energy as heat is to go to the tandem photovoltaic cells that I was talking about. What's happening is that light is being absorbed um, by the silicon, but it's not converting it as efficiently as it could be. So we'd prefer that those particular wavelengths are, are, are absorbed by other materials. But then there's also this, this uh, orange one here that I wanna pay attention to. This is light that the silicon itself cannot absorb. It, it, it has too little energy to excite electrons across the band gap in silicon. And yet it's absorbed what we call parasitically elsewhere in the model, uh, the module and, and contributes to heat. So this, um, this uh, paper from NREL where Peter used to work analyzed if I could change the solar cells, and I'll come to your question about heat sinks in a moment, if I could change the solar cells um, themselves, and I did all these different things, what would actually reduce the, the temperature the most? And it turns out reflecting these uh, low energy infrared photons that could not be absorbed is the best thing that you could do. You could lower the module temperature by almost four degrees Celsius if you did that perfectly. So there's, there's a big opportunity right there. And that's one we're working on. As I mentioned, another is to uh, increase this side of the equation, getting more power out, and that would reduce um, uh, the yellow one in, in particular. So now here's also some, some data of some, some modules we made that were measured at NREL again. Um, let me walk you through this because there's a lot going on. This is the irradiance over the course of the day, peaking at noon. These are three different flavors of modules. We built this one in blue to try to operate cooler than the other ones. And you can see that it does because on this axis over here, these are the temperatures of the modules. They generally follow the trend of irradiance. And actually what's being plotted here is the temperature above the amb ambient temperature. And you can see midday, they're 20 degrees Celsius hotter than ambient, which means in Arizona, they can be upwards of 70 degrees Celsius. But you can also see that there's some stuff going on where they don't generally follow the irradiance trend. And we can understand that if we simultaneously look at the wind speed, which was recorded. So whenever the temperature drops on the module, it's because the wind speed picked up at that particular time, right? So there is convective cooling going on. And this comes back to your, your heat sink question. Um, there have been some studies. I'm not super intimately familiar with them, but, but trying to, to um, uh, reject heat um, with, with convective cooling and, and, uh, and heat sinks. I think generally what's been concluded is the best option is don't generate the heat uh, in the first place rather than try to reject it after, after generating it. I'm sorry that I don't know more, but that's, that's the context I can share with you here. That's great. Thank you for sharing. Your, it was, you said it was your students' work? Some of it? Yeah. That's so cool. Um, Krishna Feldman, class of 1994, uh, has a question for Chris. Why is wind power dropping out of the mini grid and utility sized power generation picture? That's a great question. And um, something that Peter might want to weigh in as well. It's actually not dropping out of utility sized power. Like uh, uh, there's a 
ton of wind going in in the United States and, and worldwide. Um, so wind is a huge winner on the utility scale. But on the mini grid scale, it hasn't been so much. And I think largely that's due to the precipitous drop in PV prices. It also, in organizations like I work with, the, um, the World Bank, which is, which is interested in kind of like <laughs> scaling up these things as fast as possible. Uh, the solar model just works a little bit better because sunlight's everywhere, but um, wind resources really vary considerably from, from place to place. So if you want a consistent um, kind of cut and paste model, um, solar or solar diesel hybrids work really well. Another thing is, is uh, the physics of wind. The, um, Wind power's output goes as the square of the blade diameter, and and so um, for a materials perspective, you, you, there's some real um, benefits for for uh, economy of scale on, on the wind turbines themselves, and that's why you see um, really big wind turbines, multi megawatt wind turbines, coming in. Uh, there is a caveat to that. Um, wind is uh, is really the only option if you're in a place where it's dark for a lot of the year. So you do see a fair amount of wind up in uh, the northern or extreme southern latitudes, and there is a um, and and there are some places where the wind is just so strong and so good that that it really makes sense for mini grids. Um, and and there's also a nice complementarity, and 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 uh, Peter's software really helps model that well. Um, I mean, in general, wind speeds tend to pick up in the afternoon as as solar's kind of dropping off, and that leads well, um, sets you up well for for um, picking up the evening load. Um, but it but it all of those factors haven't been enough to kind of win out against the low price of solar. Yeah, uh, good answer, and and, and not only is wind power pr proportional to the square of the swept area or the blade diameter, I guess, but um, it's proportional to the cube of the wind speed. So it's very, very sensitive to the resource and the resource varies dramatically, whereas the solar resource doesn't really vary that dramatically. I mean, we think Portland's such a cloudy place and Phoenix such a sunny place. It's a factor of two difference in what you'd get out of a flat plate nor typical solar panel, which is not insignificant. But with wind, it can be a factor of 20 or 30 just from one side of a hill to the other side of the hill. Uh, so it's, so wind resource assessment is really important. And if you're doing a utility scale project, you can afford to, to put, the, you know, actually UL is one of the leaders in wind resource assessment. Uh, I'm, I'm not, it's a different division than I'm in, in it, but it's like $50,000 to do a full scale, you know, put up a meteorological tower, monitor it for at least a year, blah, blah, blah. And, and small scale systems just are never gonna do that. Uh, so, there, so there's resource uncertainty is a huge piece of it. It's a mechanical system that, that is, uh, requires more maintenance. Um, and so um, the biggest issue is the one Chris mentioned, the precipitous drop in PV. You know, it, wind used to, well, at utility scale, wind is still actually is cheaper than solar, but at the smaller level scales, um, wind just has more economies of scale, so and which means more expensive at smaller sizes. Um, the world's the the company in the world that sold the most wind turbines, Southwest Wind Power. They were small wind turbines for the kind of thing we're talking about here. Um, so so went went out of business. The guy, the founder of it, works for us now, uh, and he'll. That's his story. Is that you know we couldn't compete with PV. But at, at the utility scale, absolutely, There's, it's it's very competitive because they can do the wind resource assessment. They have the economies of scale. It's still going great guns for the big turbines and offshore. So we have about seven minutes left in our session, and it looks like we have five questions. So I'm going to try to get to all of them. Um, I'll do my best. Um, round. Okay, uh, Margot Tollefson, class of 1973, says: Are non-battery storage solutions being developed and used? Maybe I'll weigh in on that quickly from the mini grid scale. Um, a lot of it has to do with, well, if you can pump water during the daytime, then in a sense, you're storing that energy in the form of, of gravity in, in your water tank. And so uh, pumped water um, and as a dispatchable load, absolutely. Um, 
and and other other things like maybe you can crank your freezer down a few degrees um but things like pumped storage that you see uh widely at utility scale where where you run a, a hydropower project backwards and so forth that they're just not super practical at, at mini grid scales right and i did mention flywheels but that's kind of a niche what chris is saying load man water ma water storage water pumping load management has enormous potential and electric vehicles will i think will be will have an enormous impact because there's such a controllable load there's no reason why you'd ever be charged should ever be charging your batteries during peak periods but absorbing excess power in either at noon from solar or whatever um there was so there was one question about people are there's two companies i know of doing this thing with uh raising cement blocks and lowering them which which works i'm i'm not super optimistic about it but you never know but load management huge any thermal application heating cooling and water treatment and electric vehicles there's enormous potential there thank you Brian Martin says that Indian Health Services provides health care to the enrolled members of 574 sovereign Indian nations throughout the United States. Operational resilience related to electrical and broadband infrastructure has been a challenge for many IHS and tribal health care facilities. How would you solve infrastructure resiliency issues on tribal reservations and in non-reservation rural areas? Distributed power. That's the answer. These mini grids and microgrids. We actually created a, a tool called Powering Health, uh, poweringhealth.homerenergy.com. Uh, it's originally funded quite a long time ago by USAID for the President's Emergency Program for AIDS Relief. Uh, and then it sat for a while and the World Bank picked it up when COVID hit and we and revitalized it, for, we, we updated it. Uh, so we, we have a free online tool um, for and, and and actually, I'm working with the University of New Mexico right now on peace engineering, and that's one of their focuses is healthcare on Indian reservations. So, so we have an app for that. <laughs> Thank you. Jane Hamilton, class of 1972, has a question for Chris. Did I misunderstand why would solar panels have to be disconnected during a power outage? You mentioned that it is an issue with permitting. Yeah, well, solar panels um, have the <laughs> are there's a voltage present at solar panels anytime they're exposed to sunlight, and so the um, the 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 code, the National Electric Code in the United States, decided at some point um, if those solar panels remain connected to wires and those wires are going down off the roof, we don't want to have a problem where uh, somebody thinks that there's <laughs> no electricity on those wires and, and, and there's a potential fire hazard or a potential shock hazard. And so we wanna be able to disconnect at the module level um, th the, that electricity. So th hopefully that, that helps explain the issue. There is, a, there is a way around that though, at these microgrids, if you want resilience, you, you have to have a really bulletproof disconnection at the, at the utilities level. Uh, you don't want to electrocute the utility lines. People who are out there trying to fix things, fix whatever the outage is. So uh, they're very concerned about, rightly concerned about that. But if you have batteries along with your PV, you can keep you that going. It's, it's more expensive, more switch gear, et cetera. Uh, but that gives you the resilience. The, the fire department also has this issue about, you know, if, what do they do if they come to a home and there's PV on the roof and it's producing voltages? Um, that's an issue, which I don't understand that well, to be honest. That was uh, the one I was more referring to, Peter. Yeah, yeah. Individual level module disconnect. Just, just increasing the costs. One, one example of increasing costs of permitting. And But there is a way around that, I'm, I, but I don't have the details on that. <laughs> Uh, Richard Slarius, class of 1958, asks, is the availability of lithium limiting the quantity of lithium batteries? Are other types being looked at? Lots of other types are being looked at. Um, and there's lots of lithium in the world. It's just that the, the mining and processing capability needs to scale up. So there might be temporary issues with, takes a long time to get a mine and processing facility built. Uh, so there's some issues associated with scaling things up 
I'm not too worried about the ultimate supply of lithium. I know a lot of people talk about it and certainly sodium is a lot more available. There's, um, there's a heck so, of a lot of lithium in seawater too. I uh, just reading of a you know, new process for separating it from seawater that was pretty effective, making use of the fact it's a super small ion. So you have a selective kind of membrane thing. That it seems with lithium ion batteries, more the problem is cobalt. Um, yeah which is limited in geographic uh, availability to mostly uh, the DRC, the, the Democratic Republic of Congo, which then, you know, you run into the same kind of issues that you see around diamond mining. And um, so that'll, that'll be a more interesting one. And, and cobalt is not used in the stationary lithium ion batteries that we see going in in mini grids and in utility space. It's, it's uh, more used in higher performance, um, uh, high power output per unit weight, um, you know, Tesla batteries and stuff like that at, at, in their higher end Teslas. Well, I'm going to wrap it up. Thank you so much, uh, Chris, Peter, and Zach for an outstanding presentation. I've learned a lot. I imagine a lot of other uh, alumni have as well. So um, thank you all for your great questions and for participating in this uh, Q&A. And uh, let's see.